All right. Hey, everyone. This is Bram Kanstein, and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. Together with my guests on this podcast, I go on a journey to discover how our current financial system works, why it's flawed, and why Bitcoin is the most relevant technology that you should understand and adopt. Today, I'm joined by Knut Svanholm. He's a prolific thinker and author of several books on Bitcoin. He writes, uh, he writes about the philosophical impact of Bitcoin and how it changes the world for the better. Yeah, there they are. Some describe his writings, I don't know if you heard this, Knut, but as a guided meditation that suits the experienced and tutors the uninitiated in the ways of Bitcoin. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> in his yeah. latest book about uh, praxeology, he talks about this approach to economics and social science, where logic and deductive reasoning alone could provide more robust explanations for people's actions than empiricism ever could. I've already learned so much from him, and I'm very excited to talk to him. Knut, welcome. Happy to be here. Good yeah. to see you, Ram. Thanks so much for coming on. I just, I just told you, like, I, lo I love your thinking and your writing, and it's just fun to see how far it, it, it travels. And actually, when I read up on you more, I saw you were a tall ship sailor before. Yeah, yeah, I did that for uh, for eight years. I was the officer on a tall ship oh, with high cool. school students on board, um, sailing around the the uh, North Atlantic Ocean mostly, uh, and all throughout Europe, Mediterranean, and the Caribbean and wow. U.S. East Coast. Yeah, N nice. I'll I'll get back to that later because uh, you have a uh, Robinson Crusoe example in your book. We'll we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. Like first thing I want to ask you, like you are now a very prolific Bitcoiner, Bitcoin thinker. You share a lot about it, but what made you not understand Bitcoin when you first encountered it? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, what made me not understand it the first time I encountered it? Uh, well. I guess, like everyone, before you do a deep dive, you, you sort of dismiss it as uh, an internet fad uh, hmm. and something that may or may not become something. But it's only when you do the deep dive and you, you try to, like devil's advocate, your way <laughs> through, through <laughs> yeah. the learning process and try to debunk everything because it sounds too good. And then uh, at the end of the 10,000 hours or whatever you need to put in to actually understand it you realize that holy shit this this could actually deliver on its promises i guess an important point for me was the block size wars and uh, how that whole thing played out uh, after that my my uh, conviction if you will in bitcoin became much much more robust uh, because I, I saw that the users were actually in charge and not the big companies and not the miners. And that's, yeah. that's key. Yeah. Yeah. I find it very interesting that also when, when people talk about Bitcoin, they mentioned, uh, humility a lot, right? Like it humbles you once you understand it. And I also think that when everyone dismisses it at first nobody understands yeah. it at first right and like a dismissal of a new idea is actually very intellectually lazy and easy right you just say like oh you know it's a fad or it's a simple thing but once you actually do the work i think that what humbles you is your own like the realization of your own ignorance or something right like that you actually um yeah, weren't yeah. honest in the beginning or something not not honest to yourself. I, I mean, yeah. I'm the obviously the most humble person in the world. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, but but uh, on a on a serious note, there like uh, the the humbling part for for me personally, the humbling is uh, all. Of, I mean, it does humble you, but at the same time, I had I had personal success with my own personal journey as a official person in bitcoin which i more or less deliberately became i mean my books uh got a way more recognition that i that i expected and uh, mm. other stuff as well so so at the same time i i uh, that bitcoin humbled me i, I started to get all this appreciation for <laughs> for my work so uh uh but i i'm going to embrace that and like of course i every every single time i get a a like or a a a, a kind comment 
it it still warms my heart. I mean, I still appreciate everything. So, uh, and I, I'm I'm gonna live my life to the fullest, and I'm gonna embrace this. And if if people see value in what I do, I'm gonna do more of it. Uh, I would yeah. probably do more of it regardless. But 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 it does help fuel the fire, if you will. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. I talked with Thomas Ferrer um, in a previous episode, and once we stopped recording or we just chatted about what we like if we like the conversation you know and he said well it's actually really nice to talk to someone outside of my like local social circle and mm -hmm. and see that the like another person came to the same conclusion or has the same thoughts right that that because if you are alone on this journey to understand it then sometimes you end up at a point where you think like no it cannot be this big right like i yeah I'm a bit crazy or something, but it's nice to see the recognition in the thinking of other people. Yeah, and the funny thing is that that is true regardless of what what religion you belong to, where you come from. Like you could have read a, a completely different set of books, uh, yep. but still end up at the same conclusion. And uh, I find that highly fascinating. That to me, that's further proof that there's something real in this. That it it maps onto all sorts of different worldviews uh, as long as you're honest in your ex examination of yes. of this phenomenon. Yeah, it's actually yeah you can interpret it in a certain in in different ways. I'd say or maybe maybe it's more like you can view Bitcoin in certain ways, but like the base layer of understanding. Is is something that we share, or something like that, right? That it it goes across the interpretations of certain religions, or you know, whatever you, whatever you adhere to, I'd say. Yeah, you 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 need a, a certain level of understanding of some of the concepts, and uh, for the, and not only one field. So you not, not need to know some basic economics, uh, specifically Austrian economics. <laughs> oh, excuse me. And you need some mathematics. You need some computer skills, some knowledge about how the internet works, I guess. And yeah, you need to understand game theory to a, a certain extent as well. To, a lot to, of touch to, points. <laughs> a lot of the, dimensions. It is a lot of touch points. And uh, you need to know, I guess, for a deeper knowledge, you need to know about the energy sector and how that works and electricity and how electricity prices form and all sorts of other stuff. But but still, if you have a, a, a pretty good understanding about a little bit of this and a little bit of that in e each of these fields, uh, you can connect the dots and see that there's something here. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I don't have a like a finance or economics uh, background, so I had no clue about those dimensions. But that's maybe also why it takes so long to fully grasp what you know this could yeah. be. And like, as long as you are curious and like intellectually honest, then yeah, and then sometimes you'll that's progress. an advantage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and sometimes that's an advantage rather than a disadvantage to mm. to not know too much about economics because then you're untainted by Keynesian economics, yeah, the Keynesian exactly. ex economics yeah. taught in uh, modern universities. So so uh, you ask yourself very basic questions, uh, like how could printing more money create more wealth? And like, yes. <laughs> if, yeah. if they can print money, why do we pay taxes? And, uh, yeah. you know, why do people in the public se pay sector pay taxes at all? Like mm -hmm. s simple questions like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and yeah. Well, if, why a target of three percent inflation? Why not a hundred? Yeah. If it well, now and then, helps And people. then you also get to these points, I think, where you, um, for example, I like the in. Um, uh, I don't know if we spoke about the example in a previous episode, but like, if all the money is uh, amount is totaled in a pizza with eight pieces, right, and then they print yeah. money, the pizza doesn't get bigger, but the but the slices get smaller, right? Yeah, but that's a very good analogy. <laughs> when you think about the, the total energy captured in the in the first piece, that's now divided in two pieces. But if yeah. you buy the same thing that costs the same energy to make, you still need the same energy. So now you need, what, instead of one pizza unit, you need two pizza units, right? 
yeah. when I heard that for the first time without all my background in, <laughs> without having a background in this, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. But then if you start thinking and think like, oh, well, the people who are in charge of the money supply, they do this and blah, blah. But it, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Logically, it doesn't make sense. So then you quickly come to the conclusion that it must be ideological in a way, right? They are beyond the beyond the logic and reason. And it's more a certain yeah, I- ideology that they follow. And that's where I think, well, for me, some things clicked where I was like, yeah, I don't adhere to the ideology i adhere to the logic in this uh, in this example yeah. and and when you unpack it and uh, when you realize what it means it's it's the hurdle is a bit too big for people because they can't comprehend that that all bankers are criminals and all central bankers are you know really 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 bad criminals uh and there's no other way to explain it if if you have uh, if you're allowed to uh, counterfeit money, you're no better than any other counterfeiter. Like, why should anyone have that privilege? It's it's just vulgar and absurd uh, to think that any human being should be allowed the power to to print money for themselves, which is basically what they're doing. They're exchanging mm-hmm. it for government bonds and whatnot, and uh, um, fiat money gets created out of t- thin air when uh, when the bank. Uh, gives out a, a mortgage or a loan to someone but uh, but still it's at the heart of the the whole system is is fraud <laughs> and uh, and that realization I think that's a bit too much for for people because they they want to believe that they're living in a society that's functioning and that there's uh, I mean, uh they're well, just also right like if you think yeah that i would never do that then you think that someone else would never do that too but that's not reality no no and also like the even the people who run the central banks at this point m- may not be criminals themselves uh or may not be in their own minds be criminals mm-hmm. because they they were born they were also born into a system that is broken at its core and fraudulent at its core and uh, they they know of nothing else i mean inflationary currencies have been a- around for a long time thousands of years um i mean we we've had more or less stable systems um uh, historically uh, and it wasn't until um uh, you know 1971 where where the dollar was finally cut completely loose from uh, from any connection to gold uh that that things have gone south the way they have yeah. now during the last 50 years but or 60 years but um but it was always fraudulent to to uh more or less fraudulent let's say that yeah we'll, we'll get to that in a second but to, if we take a step back so as a former tall ship sailor, you of course used <laughs> a Robinson Crusoe example in the in your in your book about praxeology, which I think is uh, is cool. But like you share his journey, and that his journey mirrors the journey of someone who discovers and understands Bitcoin. Can you elaborate a bit on that? How how you yeah, see that? Yeah, I I deliberately left Bitcoin out of the praxeology book. I'm uh, not so subtly hinting at it uh, here and there, but I never mention the word Bitcoin. And uh, I mean, Crusoe economics is a term in itself, right? And uh, and it's it's a good framework because it starts from the individual and explains economics from the individual and up. Uh, and I got the idea for for the Crusoe theme for the book halfway through the writing process. So like, oh, this is this is how we tie this thing together. We we use Crusoe for all examples. And a lot can be learned from from just uh reasoning yourself to what would happen to Crusoe if he did X or if he did Y. Mm. Like uh, if it's the first example I think is him catching fish with his hands. And then he can catch X amount of fish per time unit, and if he's if he saves up some fish and uh, chooses not to fish with his hands for X amount of hours per day, but instead spends his time producing a net, then that 
sacrifice of capital allows him to catch more fish per time unit later on in his life. And that's the importance of, of capital and the importance of being able to save the fruits of your labor for a later date. Um, yeah. So even there, you can see, <laughs> you, you can draw parallels to how money printing is a, a crime. <laughs> yeah. And it also kind of ties in with what Jeff Boots uh, talks about, you know, when he says that technology should eventually um, make things cheaper slash more efficient right like instead of catching fish with your hands when you invent technology like a net in the same time you have more fruits of the same labor right so that is that the same illustration there yeah i i guess uh, uh sorry i had to um send a message here um so can can you repeat the question uh, yeah, so, again? So, Sorry. So the <laughs> example that Jeff Booth gives about, you know, technology makes everything cheaper slash more productive, right? And so Robinson catches fish with his hands, then he invents the technology of his net or he creates a net and then in yeah, the same yeah. time frame slash energy expenditure, he gets more fruit for the same labor, which yeah. eventually, well, conceptually goes on and on, right? But when you look at the current system, that is that is what's been broken in a sense yeah yeah the the, uh, the the thing with jeff's argument there is that it's absolutely true it's not only that it would have been true it is true at all times that the um, uh, marginal cost of production in a free market the marginal cost of production for all goods and services uh, the, all all prices fall to their marginal cost of production that's the sentence yeah. Yeah. um so over time, things get cheaper and cheaper. And if they don't, you're using the wrong denominator. <laughs> it's as simple as yes. that. If you're using then Bitcoin the as your denominator. Is broken, right? Yeah, yeah. So you could use Bitcoin. You could use kilowatt hours. The, they, that would give you a better result than mm -hmm. using dollars and cents. Like, yeah. how, how much did... What's the price of this in kilowatt hours? And, uh, <laughs> or, or what's the price of this in Bitcoin? And that will give you a different figure than if you... If you denominate in dollars, yeah, yeah, I find that fascinating. Uh, I had this example already on once. If you go to tradingview.com and you pick any stock, any index, and you put it against USD, then the the numbers, the price goes up mostly. Yeah, but if you put it in the money supply, um, it's mostly down. And actually, the most fascinating yeah. one I found was the. Um, the Nasdaq about the tech stocks where the value of the current tech stocks, so the value in M2 is less than at the height of the 2000 uh, dot com bubble, which arguably is, you know, we can view that it's not less valuable, right? Like we have more technology, we have better technology, we have yeah, yeah, yeah. all these things, but in value, it's absolute value, it's down. Yeah, that's. Uh, crazy yeah <laughs> to and, see. and it's because yeah. of money print it, it's because someone is counterfeiting money that's uh or currency that's uh that is the problem it's stealing from everyone everywhere at the same time at all times yeah. and it's it's a greatest scam ever committed <laughs> and why is that so it hard truly to see? Is. why is that so hard to see for because people like everyone also, yeah because everyone is living in it like everyone is so used to it and have been for generations so so we can we can't see the truth it's like uh, this is like there are a lot of christian bitcoiners out there who won't like this next thing but but i view uh, uh, bitcoin as financial atheism like we're we're not the cult we're the ones leaving the cult the cult is fiat because fiat requires you to believe in something that you can't verify bitcoin does yes. not it doesn't require you to believe anything. It requires understanding, which is another another thing altogether. So, so I don't think Bitcoiners are a religious cult. We're we're the ones who are, who have dared to left to leave the cult that we were in, which was the fiat monetary cult. Yeah, yeah. Is this what you in the book you also talk about the truth goggles? 
<laughs> right? Is this yeah, yeah, Could from we... that uh, uh, Carpenter movie? Yeah. Um, it it gives you truth, Carlos. When you start seeing things from this perspective and from an individualist perspective, a consensualist perspective, if you will, or a Bitcoiner perspective, and you denominate stuff in Bitcoin, you see the world for what it truly is instead of seeing uh, this deliberate facade. And how sometimes you hear people say, like, once you see it, you cannot unsee it, right, in Bitcoin. But how does that apply to to then the current world, like the current system, if we like the one of the goals of of this podcast is, of course, to help people find the threads that they can pull, right, to start their own like rabbit hole <laughs> journey. Yeah. Um, what are these things that you that you couldn't unsee anymore once you saw like the once you stepped out of what you call the cult? Well. You're seeing money printing for what it is. It's uh, it's stealing from everyone's time everywhere. Like that that's the key thing. Yeah. Uh, but also seeing what the effects of that is that everything gets politicized. So in like in a totally free market, uh, the uh, wh- whoever can provide you the best goods and services for the lowest price uh, wins the market and. Uh, Therefore, they they are rewarded. Uh, and in the current system, where where the game is rigged so that the closer you are to the monetary spigot, due to the uh, the, the Cantillon effect uh, kicks in, which is that people who are closer to it get richer faster, and everyone else pays for that um, that asymmetry. So yeah. so uh, what that means in in real term is in real terms is that it becomes more important for a market market actor to be to have friends in high places than to actually provide good uh, good goods and good services. So for instance uh for an airline today it's way more important to be connected politically so that you can get bailed out when when you don't sell enough flight tickets uh than it is to actually provide uh a, a good flight experience yeah so so uh this is the thing everything becomes a political game where lobbyism becomes very important if you ever go to brussels i i urge you to drive through the 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 block where all the lobbyists live because that was very eye opening for me uh to see these luxurious apartments um uh, that is where the real power desi- uh, resides. Uh, whoever, because money is a stronger force than than uh, than political will. Uh, so so uh, politicians can be bought. Yeah. Uh, scientists can be bought. Everyone can be bought for the for the right price. And if not outright bribed, they can be pushed into uh, focusing their attention and efforts in in directions that they wouldn't have chosen on the free market uh which uh, which produces clown world why why we get these arbitrary things to to uh fight about in, instead of focusing on how yeah. do we make li- like life better for the most amount of people how do we free up um people so that they can pursue life liberty and, and property and prosperity like um, instead, it becomes this game of appeasing uh, or, or <laughs> pleasing, pleasing the bureaucrats and pleasing the politicians and pleasing the media. Yeah, and is is it also? I mean, your 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 airline example is interesting. I think last <laughs> week I read that Delta, I think it was Delta Airlines, makes more money on the interest of their of the credit cards they they give out, like their. Um, you know uh, how do you call it like flight points or whatever like how you can save yeah, yeah. points like they get more revenue from the interest on the cards than revenue from the flights that <laughs> the seats that, that they sell yeah it, isn't that then also like uh does the brokenness of the money also open up like the like ex- ex- i almost want to say like the exploitation of 
the people who are kind of like subject to the broken money, kind of like how Delta has Absolute, credit cards. Absolutely. Everyone, what happens when money is broken and can't store value over time is that people invent new money and they they use other things as money, like yeah. real estate, for instance. Uh, people save in houses instead of saving in cash in a bank account because that makes no sense today since you lose yeah. money over time doing that. So instead they invest in risky things that do not have a guaranteed return. Uh, nothing has a guaranteed return, but but the money is broken, so you can't save in money. So so air miles, uh, for instance, <laughs> yeah. becomes yeah. becomes a a new means of uh, of saving for the airline company mostly. But the, the, and uh, yeah, so every that is the air miles are are are. are um, one aspect of every company becoming a bank when they're big enough they start to become a bank like you can see yeah. supermarkets having their own banks and like if you, if you uh become a member here you get this and that discount the same with you know large electronics stores and everything every every large chain becomes this um bank like entity where where you're supposed to be rewarded for being loyal to them uh and that's is that is a product of fiat currency it it wouldn't exist if uh money wasn't broken and how about because i i think you probably believe in a in a meritocracy and and then also kind of in capitalism or what you said right like if i make the best products yeah. for the lowest price then i win and if you do if if i make better cakes than than your cakes then you lose you have to do something else right but yeah the the ca capitalism in that definition is then also broken because the money is broken, right? It, it, yeah, if well, we it fix isn't the money, capitalism. Do we still... it, well, yeah, it, it, we've never had such a thing as real capitalism. Like just like the argument the the socialists used, like the, we've never seen real socialism. <laughs> uh, I would argue that we've never seen real capitalism. Uh, we we mm. have seen real socialism. It sucks, uh, but we haven't seen real capitalism. All we've seen is more or less central planning but it's always centrally planned and yeah. uh, so so uh, we'll see what happens in argentina here in the com forthcoming months but uh uh yeah it's interesting yeah, to yeah. see the in, the reactions on that also i think yeah like, but when uh, the money's broken it's all central planning it doesn't matter if you're yeah. a liberal or conservative or a green party or whatever other political yeah. Uh, I mean, it's all central planning <laughs> at the end of the day because there's a central bank planning the supply of money. So they uh, that mechanism allows for political influence everywhere and uh, politicians steering society into whatever directions they see fit for their yeah. own interests. And this ties into something I wanted to ask about the book. You, you talk about, um, you discuss the relationship between uh, irrefutable statements about human beings in in the book, mm -hmm. and what is the relationship with how Bitcoin is decentralized? Like my interpretation is that you know, and we just talked about it. I think like once we all accept that when people like you and I, when we are given the choice to exploit a system that we are part of, like most people will do that. Although we think we wouldn't, like that is. When a system is corruptible and you can um, get a benefit from that, then you know there are people who who do that, right? And yeah. Bitcoin helps us mitigate that human flaw yeah. because we cannot trust ourselves and others like individually. We need a, a no. protocol or a set of layers we can trust, so that we don't have to trust other humans, right? Like that's the trustlessness of Bitcoin. That's kind yeah. of like my interpretation of that. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty pretty solid explanation, and I think the word decentralization gets thrown around too much, and and it's used in the wrong context because decentralization is a an unfortunate means to a much greater end. So yes. the only reason that we need decentralization is that what you said, like that we can't trust one another with 
controlling the money supply. It would be way easier if there was a trustworthy guy who could just keep one Excel sheet of everyone's transactions and we could trust that guy. That would yeah. be way <laughs> cheaper, way faster, way better in every sense. It's just that we have this problem that we can't because the incentive to, to abuse that is too large. So that's what the decentralization does. It it allows for a global uh, free market, sound money, sound money free market to exist, and that is the real deal because that's what leads to the meritocracy. That's what leads what leads to ever falling prices and better everything for everyone everywhere all at once. And why is that then? If like the money, so the technology we use to exchange value with each other is transparent and open and uh, all, all these things why does that make it better it does does it then well, actually give us more trust or what what does it say about the, the well trust? it's not it's not the transparent and open here that we need transparent and open to assure that this is actually the case but the key point yes. is the absolute supply like the the finite supply the the uh, the supply cap that that no one can ever make more of this thing. Uh, so instead of having, uh, th this is actually a pizza that that gets cut Cannot. into twenty one million pieces, uh, yes. or two point one quadrillion pieces to be exact. Uh, but this pizza can grow larger, <laughs> and yes. uh, uh, your share of the pizza stays the same no matter how large the pizza gets. So abundance in in in. Uh, in money, scarcity everywhere else, and vice versa. Abundance in everything else uh, requires scarce money. And so that's also the meme, right? On the shirt you're wearing is yeah, everything, everything divided. <laughs> yeah, but but like one 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 like a bit deeper on that. I like the analogy of actually you have like all the money units, right? Like what you said, the twenty one mm -hmm. quadrillion is like the in in Satoshi's like the smallest. Uh, part of a bitcoin those are yeah. the numbers to keep count one satoshi equals etc but the pizza represents the value right so those are two oh, different yeah, things oh, it, yeah it represents all economic value in uh, currently in bitcoin like <laughs> yeah the, exactly yeah or and what the, people uh, decided to save or store in bitcoin then yeah yeah exactly it, like uh, we uh, uh, the, the point of the equation is that theoretically, the entire world economy could be, de be denominated in this uh, not ever changing number, yeah. Uh, which, uh, yeah, translated easily to the least amount of characters. That's everything divided by twenty-one million. That's what it means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it also means everything now, but also and, everything in the future then, right? Like everything exactly, that Exactly, ever... which is a completely mind-blowing thought because it changes everything about how everything works. Like you could even imagine starting a company in the future not to have black numbers on your balance sheet, but just to slow slow down the pace of your diminishing stack because you need to pay for everything in Bitcoin. So your yeah. stacks will eventually diminish, even though your purchasing power can still go up. So it's going to be very hard for humanity to wrap their heads around this, uh, yeah, <laughs> especially is, uh, in the long run. I think tomorrow, next week I'm talking to Michael Dunworth. Do you know him? Oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah we're so, good friends. Uh, yeah, so it, I love his uh, mind too, but he talks about sending Bitcoin to the future and basically yes. doing what you just said, right? You can send it to the future so you don't have it now. You can program basically a time lock right that you can only yeah, access yeah, yeah. it in 30 years and despite having the same amount the number of whatever satoshis in the future yeah. it will represent a different value than what it represents now yeah I... tell him tell him i said uh, <laughs> that he should focus more on the numero on weird numerology and stop worrying about magnets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll set this up before <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. we talk. Yeah, but but I think that's also the fun part. I think that there's something in Bitcoin for everyone, right? Like whatever you find Absolutely. interesting or whatever floats your boat, like you can find it in Bitcoin. And that's also why I think for me, at least it's sometimes but hard to communicate th because you make it so big. Like yeah. yeah, but of course there's something for everyone because it's money. Like 
there's something for everyone in money. Like if if there's a thing that you can buy other things with that people are willing to trade for other things, <laughs> yeah. of course there's something in it for you. Like <laughs> uh, it's the and, ultimate thing, actually. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's the thing with the with the least diminishing marginal utility ever. <laughs> yeah. If, if you follow that, that's a long, complicated sentence. Uh, but it's one of the uh, laws of economics, the, the law of dim diminishing marginal returns. So if you, if you have an apple, if you're hungry, you can eat the apple. Uh, if you have two apples, the first apple will give you more pleasure than the second it will uh, it will uh, mm. uh you, you're probably fed up after after the first apple okay or at least the first yeah. apple will give you nourishment to find another apple to eat like so the each additional unit of a, a homogeneous good which is also subjective by the way but that's another story um has a diminishing return to you so like more of stuff more stuff of the same stuff doesn't really make you richer because each unit of something has less and less value. And the thing is, money has a uh, uh, th this effect is in money too, but not to the same extent. Since you can exchange money for absolutely anything else, it has a very low uh, diminish diminishment of mm, the, its yeah. marginal utility. But there's still a point where no where more money doesn't make any sense like where it doesn't bring you that much more <laughs> joy <laughs> or yeah. what well, it's uh, one of the things i actually wanted to ask um like what is wealth for you and does wealth equate happiness well wealth is uh, like when you study praxeology you really realize the importance of using the using correct worth the correct words <laughs> now yeah. i use the wrong word just because <laughs> but wealth is different than being rich like being wealthy sort of means you have capital and capital can be capital goods or it can be money uh, or it can be some some way of storing time um uh, so being wealthy to me is having a lot of capital uh, regardless of in which shape or form, way, shape or form that capital is. But being rich is, to me, is another thing. Uh, being rich sort of means getting to decide what to do uh, for yourself uh, as much as possible during your life. Like a person who comes to the insight that that which they can do without their own early on in life in my mind, is a richer person than someone who keep, keeps on chasing more money throughout his life without really questioning why. Uh, so if you really want to be free and able to do whatever you want to do, then that is the thing to aim for. Of course, money helps with that since money is support, at least true money as Bitcoin, because... Uh, Money is supposed to store store up time for you for later use, so you can yeah. trade your. Uh, and the more of it you have, the more you the the freer you are because you can you can buy yourself time. But another thing that frees you up is realizing that you don't need to be a materialist. You don't really need much more than a toothbrush, uh, <laughs> and uh, and a laptop and a phone maybe. And uh, I would add a guitar to that. But other <laughs> than that, I have very few material cravings. And that frees up a lot of time, too. So, uh, Why yeah. do you think that is... Uh, I, I, I love that. I see that as a common theme with a lot of people that see and understand Bitcoin and own it. Yeah. It makes you more... Yeah, I don't think frugal is the right word, but it's um, less like materialistic. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's like. And uh, I, I think there's yeah. there's a very yeah. good explanation for that. If you have inflationary mm. money, you're incentivized to spend it, because if you don't spend it, it loses its value. So yeah. you're always incentivized to buy more shit mm. to if get the the energy that it represents now exactly, instead of exactly. future whatever you don't know how much yeah, energy yeah. you have, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
so you have a high time preference basically. If you if you have a, a money with a fixed supply, you have a low time preference, and because you know that if you don't spend but save instead, you'll have more tomorrow. You'll have access to more things, more goods, yes. more services later on. And this is the path to seeing that stuff isn't that important. Like this is the path to mm. seeing that uh, living a more modest life is key to uh to becoming wealthy in the in the true sense of the word in the yeah. in the long run and being or, or i should use the word rich here in yeah. order to live live a rich life yeah i think two things they're like it slows your time down right yeah. it's uh, we all have the same time well whatever you think time is yeah everyone way, lives 100 percent <laughs> of their lives yeah, yeah exactly exactly <laughs> um no, but the lower time preference also gives you the um, well s mental space to think about what do I actually want to contribute? Like, what do I want to do? Like, the space for you to yeah. figure that out is created instead of consumed by whatever quick, uh, uh, how do you say, and, uh, thing yeah, you can and, get to satisfy. Exactly. And here we come into the thing that I just can't stop thinking about because... You get more time as a Bitcoin. You get more time on your hands because you realize this these things. Like uh, you, you become incentivized to have a lower time preference. So you, so you save rather than spend. You, uh, you start prioritizing quality over quantity. And also, for this to, in order for this to work, Bitcoin needs to work, and Bitcoin needs to succeed and grow its purchasing power over time. So how do we make that happen? We uh, we help other Bitcoiners with whatever they do. So yeah. we're incentivized to save rather than spend. And we're incentivized to help one another. So I'm, that's why I'm on this pod. I'm incentivized to help you. And that's why you're interviewing me. You're incentivized to help me. We, want, we both yes. want the same goal it's here. It's not a zero-sum so, exchange, no. right? Uh, so, we're, so we're giving each other our time right now. We're in a trade right now. Yeah. Without sending a single Satoshi. Yes. <laughs> Which means that Bitcoiners are incentivized to be fucking awesome to one another and not spend. So I see the, the usage of money going down on a Bitcoin standard so that we won't need money as much as mm. we did before because we just become better people. Uh, more trustworthy because we have this base layer of trust already, which allows for more trust on the human layers above, on yes, top of it yes yes because because you can't cheat the system uh so so i see this it it's gives a you something else to do basically <laughs> yeah right? because the, the killer yeah. app of bitcoin is you it's not mm. it's not something technical it's the, the human being that is changed from the inside yeah uh so it it allows us to wear our hearts on our sleeves uh and be be excellent to one another it's and this like is you find they, uh, when gratification. you gratification. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll keep on the rant. This is sort of my shtick here. Yeah, but, go for uh, it. Go for uh, it. <laughs> uh, if you think about what Bitcoin is, so like uh, Bitcoin has been described as anything from from a potato to uh, you know digital cash or yeah. hope or whatever. Everyone frames it differently, but at its core, it's ones and zeros. It's just binary bits of information. Um, and uh, we, every Bitcoiner, if to own a Bitcoin or to possess a Bitcoin is just keeping a secret. That's all it is. If you memorize your 12 words and you destroy every other location the 12 words are in, uh, you you literally are the bitcoins. There's no distinction yes. between the bitcoins and you. Yes. But unpack that a, a bit more. Every other bitcoin that is not in someone's head is still is in someone's head because it requires that person to keep a secret. The secret of the pin code, the location of the device, whatever. It always mm. involves keeping a secret somehow. So we are all our bitcoins. <laughs> we are the same entity. And if you think about what a node is, it's yeah, a it's a yeah, conscious it becomes a consciousness no well it's the node is just a fancy abacus <laughs> the only thing it does it uh, it helps its owner do the verification yeah which is just a bunch of calculations so it helps 
its owner with the maths. But it's still the owner. There needs to be human action. <laughs> the, the a guy needs to or a girl needs to buy this thing, plug it in, run the software, and do the verification himself. Same is true for a miner. A miner is just is not an ASIC. Uh, it's a guy trying to guess a number, and he buys ASICs to help him guess numbers faster. That's all they do. <laughs> they yeah. guess numbers. Uh, <laughs> so. So everything in Bitcoin is the people in Bitcoin. They're using mental tools to help them calculate. That's all there is to it. Yeah. So we are the Bitcoins, and they help us be more awesome to one another, which is just... What the fuck is this thing? <laughs> it, it's, uh, and that makes me think... That means to me. But that, that also means... means taking ownership, right? Like that, the, the don't trust, verify. You do the action to, uh, verifying to verify is that not other only people... verifying, yeah. but also adding. So it's again this. No, the, no, it's the... it's it's uh, yeah, it's verifying that other people are truthful. But yeah. if they if if everyone was, <laughs> if there were no scammers, we wouldn't need this thing. <laughs> yeah, which means that we all had this with within us all along. To me, that's yes. what this says. Yes. That we we never really needed this in the first place. We only need it because we we didn't figure out any other way of how to unlock yeah. that fucking immense power that is already within us. Yes. I yeah I I have to think about what you just said, but yeah I think I think for me like I love this angle of Bitcoin where. Uh, I also I, I also think like you see it almost and more as a philosophy, right? It's a philosophy that's kind of like backed by the in the the discovered technology in a sense, but eventually it's it's not yeah. just a technology. It's Absolutely way more, not. way way more than that. I mean, the technology would be nothing without the human actors acting upon the technology like yeah. if if humans didn't act we wouldn't have like we wouldn't have any technology but that's beside the point like this specific yeah. technology is literally nothing without its users yeah a car is still a car whether or not it has a driver in in it or or not but a bitcoin is not a bitcoin until a person interacts with it yes and, and, and th th here's another f because i'm uh, on a roll here like Go. uh here's another funny thought all all the numbers in bitcoin that is to say all the private keys all the bitcoins have always existed it's just that the hashing power was zero uh up until 2009 or or 2011 mm. <laughs> So, but all the numbers were already there. It's yeah. just that we didn't know about this way to use them. So, in that sense, exactly, it's way yeah. much more of a discovery than an invention. Yes, yeah, I like to I like to talk about a discovery as well because yes, yeah. I agree. Just you also mean like just in general, math exists, the numbers existed already. It's how you utilize them and then create yeah. the 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 effect in the in the, in, in yeah. the physical realm in a sense. Right. Exactly. It's yeah. uh, and I, uh, what I like. Yeah. In Bitcoin, there's a lot of these. Um, what's the word in English? I don't want to say funny, but it's like um, it's like consequences of Bitcoin that are actually um, like solve things for the people that don't see Bitcoin at all. Which I I don't, I don't know how to call that in English, but for example, mm -hmm. when we just talked about you know you your time gets slower, so you get more mental space to figure out how can I add value to mutual exchanges, not the all these zero sum games, uh, etc. Yeah. We by doing that, we well by adopting Bitcoin, the people slowly also undermine the system that other people <laughs> uh, yeah. keep afloat and. Because they are so entrenched in keeping this current system afloat, they don't pay attention. Well, they they see Bitcoin, but well, we'll see we'll see what happens, right? But their the incentives are not aligned. So the people who are currently have the biggest incentive to exploit the system, they will be the last to actually yeah that's adopt one, it. Th that's one aspect of it. But you can you can do that thought experiment even deeper, like. Uh, 
since this Bitcoin, uh, so as more and more money flows into Bitcoin, it also flows out of the fiat system, disempowering yes. that and empowering Bitcoin. Yes. But that's another thing. As Bitcoin, uh, as the Bitcoin economy grows, that allows for a very well-oiled global uh, trading machine that can trade goods and services over, which pushes costs down, production costs and transportation costs down because of free market competition. For everyone, not just Bitcoiners. Yes. <laughs> Even fiat people yeah. benefit, whether they like to or not, from the success of Bitcoin. Yes. So, so it's a success for absolutely everyone, except dishonest people who try to steal from others. That's, yeah. Those are the only ones that have something to lose from this. Do you think that's also the biggest kind of like paradigm shift in a sense the the like the 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 fair you know don't trust verify is kind of like uh, aligned with you know we follow rules instead of rulers and we follow the yeah. rules because we cannot trust ourselves and therefore on also not the rulers that's you know yeah, yeah, that yeah. one realization we talked about is that the biggest kind of like paradigm shift that people also will need to learn as in well it will make you more sovereign and more in control and give you more space but you do need to do the work as well you you will get the responsibility for also getting the 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 those new positive elements in a sense in your life like you also it's not free right where some no, stuff no, no, in the no. current system is free no. this is not free no, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and there is also exactly. no second breakfast, uh, as Michael <laughs> Saylor would have put it. So, yeah. uh, no, it's not free, but but over time, as as number grows up, people who uh, who put in work and un to un put in the work to understand this thing and get some bitcoin and uh start changing their lives in order to be able to be more bitcoiny <laughs> are going mm -hmm. to be rewarded for that behavior and other yes. people are going to see that uh see that play out and then they're going to see you know they're going to keep on seeing videos and photos of us bitcoiners having a swell time at any uh, everywhere in the world and just living our lives as, as we see fit and that is going to rub off on other people. I mean, I um, when I quit my fiat job, for instance, like I think that at least the more curious-minded people in that office uh, keep an eye on me now and see what happens to me <laughs> after I made that move, if I'm doing okay or if it was a <laughs> catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it is, uh, whenever you choose to, devote your life to this thing uh people will notice and they will notice if you fare well or not like uh <laughs> so it is setting an example i guess yeah and that's also uh that that number go up right like the price that people see the people that are also not yet into bitcoin that is obviously like one of the primary drivers because they will be like Okay, am I? Well, they they can still dismiss it, obviously. But some people, it's kind of like every cycle, you get like a new chunk of of people that yeah um, have it's opened take their a mind while, to but, yeah yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> well, what will happen it, if we? Uh, I, I hear uh, uh, Peter Dunworth, like Michael Michael's brother, he talks about mm -hmm. you know one day we're going to wake up and one Bitcoin will be one million. Will that be shocking enough for most people to pay attention? You think, or hope? I, I hope. I guess. I, I guess we'll have to wait and see. This, this, yeah. it's hard to predict the future like that. But I expect, like, I think we'll see. Uh, like, if if I'm gonna make any predictions about the future, is that uh, one of these bull runs is gonna be the big one where it goes absolutely bonkers like where there's because there simply aren't enough bitcoins around uh and when people realize that they they have everything to gain from not selling not even in the bull run then things will start to get weird uh so we might see these cycles a couple of more times before that happens but yeah. one of these bull runs is going to be the bull run that that 
that triggers hyperbicarnization. Yeah. And if like, which sounds weird and sounds wild, but how couldn't it be? Like, how how could you stop that from from happening? How could you? What, how could you stop people from realizing that there's a better system? Like it's unstoppable. Yeah, you, you, you can't. Yeah. Anything you will do will legitimize it. I think, right? Like what you said, if people move, yeah. that was one of my insights at one point. Where yeah. I felt like I don't see it as buying Bitcoin anymore. I see it as moving my my energy from one system to another. So that's when I yeah. started doing that. And once they, you know, they uh, uh, the the current system in the current system they don't like it, of course, because they cannot make more money out of your money so they will start closing the doors probably that will happen at some point and well you've you, we've already seen it happen and like yeah. those are these these things that will show some people that hey is is the, is the money in the bank actually mine and then what is money and why don't they want me to take out that what i own and then you know slowly <laughs> Uh, yeah. find out more about how it works but but if any one of us runs into tr legal trouble or whatever i mean look at how much they raised for hodlonauts trial against uh craig wright for instance mm -hmm. yeah like instantly everyone shipped in and uh, he raised a lot of money in no time and nobody knows uh, knows him personally well i do but most most bitcoiners don't uh and still yeah they're on his side because that that battle was important and many future battles will be important too but there are a lot of wealthy people in this already and we got each other's backs and we're everywhere around the globe the meetups are small but they're everywhere they're mm -hmm. literally everywhere uh yeah. in in uh in germany there's a meetup in every major city every week in spain like uh I went to one the other day here and uh I've realized that they're almost everywhere here too. They're in um, yeah, Valencia, uh, Alicante, it, Madrid, Sevilla. How can you stop they're an everywhere. idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's it, I think. It's more an idea and Yeah, yeah you it. can't. Yeah, an idea has time has come. It's it's yeah. it's completely unstoppable. Yeah. One thing I wanted to ask you about as well, I think it was you who gave the example, and correct me if I'm wrong, but about you can put a um, a seed a seed phrase in a in in a vault somewhere in the world. This was you, right? I think. It yeah, was I you. think so. Yeah, yeah. You can put a seed phrase, so the access to a Bitcoin wallet, in a vault somewhere, and as long as you know the the public key of it, so the wallet address, you can send value to that. Without even no, entering. no, no! It's no, it's the other way around. Oh, the other way around. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, so you, you, the, the, the thought experiment is make a paper wallet, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you obviously need the private key outside of the vault. Oh yeah, but, that was it. Yeah, so you yeah. can access the vault without going to the vault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or uh, let let me see if I if I. Yeah, yeah. Except no, you're right. You need the public. You you only need the public key in the vault, <laughs> but you need to scan it first, and then yeah. you can send money into the vault. It's a yes. it's a ridiculous thought experiment, but it, but it's it comes from a, a true story. One of my first mind blow moments uh, in in Bitcoin was just fiddling around a, a, at home with paper wallets, and I had one, uh, and I scanned the the public key. And I put it in an envelope, and then I sent Bitcoin to the paper in that envelope. So <laughs> I realized, so like, I just beamed money through the through the envelope. Uh, like, how though? How 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 can that work? Mm -hmm. And if I, but the funny thing is, if I can beam it through paper, I can beam it through concrete as well. I can beam it through anything. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's information. This is the thing. This is what element zero is. It it has no weight. It doesn't care about uh, physical reality. It's all in our heads. Yeah. I think this is one of the things that once you see this, then I think you go all in on, on understanding more of Bitcoin, I want to say, or Bitcoin itself. But 
it's such a different way of framing how something works. Like it's actually feels way simpler in a sense than how a lot of current things work because it's just yeah. the ones and the zeros change and it corresponds with yeah. you know this hash, etc. Like it's just I also had one thought some weeks ago that it's it's only text. I read the the full uh blockchain is like five hundred gigabytes, I think ish. Five, six hundred gigabytes. And then I thought this is just text. It's only text. It's just one big crazy text file in a sense and yeah. yes when you give that example of how you send a part of a bitcoin to another number it just adds just numbers are added to this long list yeah, of yeah, numbers yeah. and and that is just it like it, it's and crazy just to tie back to the example of the paper wallet in the in the vault because yeah. if if that money is to be usable you need both the private key you, you need a, a public key and a private key printed on the same paper in the vault. In the vault, yeah. Or well, not the same paper, but you need both keys to be in the vault in order for anyone to be able to spend it. But you don't need to put the 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 thing is you don't need to put the money on the paper before you put it into the vault. You can lock the vault first, as long as you you have the yes. public key. And also, so once you the... hold the paper, you can say this this paper with in pen written numbers and <laughs> letters on yeah, it yeah. is worth xyz value right like like you can actually say that and and yeah that and what how... it represents is totally somewhere else actually and how cool is a mnemonic <laughs> seed phrase really like that you can travel with money in your head like that yeah. it's it's it still blows my mind every day that that is absolutely 100 percent real and possible it changes yeah. everything yeah i agree I love I, I mean, love these thoughts. So this is yeah, yeah. The my first goal of talking to you, I love it. <laughs> first time, first time I had an epiphany about the twelve words was like uh, going through airport security a long time ago, and like uh, and they emptied my uh, my bathroom bag uh, mm. and threw away my toothpaste, and I'm like, all right, you can have my toothpaste. <laughs> You yeah. can't have my twelve words. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, like there's, there's no way you can have my twelve words. There's not. You you can't even know that I have them. But but go ahead, take the toothpaste. Yeah, no, no, no. This is absolutely true. Like the 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 the. Not many people have felt that sovereign. In a no, in, and in it's history, empowering in general, hell. right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no not never. Never. It's it's a completely new mode of being. Like, uh, and it allows you to be yourself to the fullest extent possible. You don't have to yeah. play any fiat games. You can like, uh, yeah. It's it's like the example before. You said you appreciated me telling you that I was lazy. So like, so what? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, fun. <laughs> it's fun. It makes you. It makes it simpler life or something. Like I, f I find it fascinating yeah. to, uh, yeah. and also really, really fun to talk and to more you because honest. it also helps more me honest. challenge my own thoughts. Yeah, it's more honest. It's uh, it's it's real. It's also I never really met a Bitcoiner I didn't like because we have some sort of uh, common understanding about very things that are very core to humans. I think, right? Like it, that, that you discovered yeah. something within yourself that you know is hard work. Like it, it takes, um, it takes work to figure that out. And and when you meet other Bitcoiners, you know they did the same thing, and everyone has their own individual yes. str struggle in a sense, right? But that is what the bond yeah. is, I think. So you can skip all the bullshit conversations about the weather <laughs> yes. and yes, go exactly. go go into how how entropy. Uh, is a requirement for consciousness or something instead like <laughs> yeah, have these deep, deep philosophical things direct, uh, they're instantly yeah so i have i have two two last questions for you one is like what are you talk to a lot of people about bitcoin obviously like what are the most common counter arguments you still face and like how how do you respond to to them the counter arguments yeah uh, there are only bad ones. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. it's only used by criminals, and uh, yeah, then you try to point out that the real criminals are the bankers and the central bankers mm -hmm. and the politicians. But uh, most people don't see the world that way. 
Uh, the other thing but is when you the, say like when you say there are no informed critiques, right? That's also what Michael Saylor says. Like it sounds so. Uh, it's a it, hyperbolic uh, reply. Yeah, it sounds right? a bit like, arrogant, maybe. Yes, but yeah. like, well, there isn't none. Like, they, I, I got the question for a, a questionnaire once. Like, what's the biggest threat to Bitcoin? And the biggest threat I could think of was Godzilla. Godzilla is a <laughs> laser-eyed monster with the, you know, fire breath and whatever. Uh, yeah. 200 meters tall and can destroy buildings. That that that's probably the biggest threat to Bitcoin there is. <laughs> can you elaborate? Like why? This is a random answer, or well, am well, I misunderstanding? It's, it's, it's <laughs> at least as real as all the other tra- threats. Oh, like that? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just as crazy. Just yeah, as yeah. Un- unfounded. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, fun. I, I do think this is one of our challenges in the sense like it it sounds arrogant, but it's true. Like I would love to see debates between, I don't know, you and someone who actually truly believes and can argument why Bitcoin is a Ponzi or this or that or whatever. But yeah, there are show me that person though. There's nothing. There's nothing. Yeah. And that is also uh yeah, it's a rationale, right? Like, well, if you think it sucks, well, well, come and talk, you know, like, let's really talk about it. And because people don't do that, you know, they don't uh, believe what no. they say they believe, right? Well, like, there are legitimate criticisms about some of the functionalities, like mm-hmm. uh, the uh, the fee structure and that there always has to be a trade-off between block size and fees and whatever. And uh, also the... but. The answer to that is, have you never heard about the Lightning Network? And then there's criticisms about that, that 70% of the Lightning Network users use custodial services and not their own thing. Yeah, but still, it's better than a fucking bank, and you can still put the stuff in cold storage when you can ho- come home and just use this as a you know, facilitator. And yeah. then there's criticisms about... Um, uh, what else is there? Well, there's the environmentalist FUD, but that's very easily debunked. There's nothing better for the uh, for the planet than Bitcoin because you, look, it leads to a world where resources aren't misallocated anymore, and that's the key thing. And mm-hmm. the consensus mechanism is where, yeah, I did this in the Satoshi versus Oppenheimer uh, video we made uh, a couple of uh, months back uh, about how the so bitcoin the bitcoin network has exp- uh, has used around 2000 terajoules of energy so far or exajoules or so i don't remember exactly the figure or or the prefixes for it uh, but the point of the video is that the largest atomic bomb uh, ever a, the largest explosion made by men uh consumed more energy than the bitcoin network has so far so the worst thing you can do if you want uh, <laughs> the the absolute worst thing you can do for the for the uh, for the earth for um, the environment is give money to the state because they are the ones that keep exploiting it and keep destroying it like <laughs> that's the yeah. worst use case for <laughs> i mean it's way worse than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is is enabling us to to not th- do that to the same extent anymore, and to instead just have a system where as few resources are misallocated as possible, and where people don't crave as much consumerist bullshit stuff every day. That's a that's a great <laughs> that's a great summary. Um, all right, last question. I ask everyone the same question. And that is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? I believe that communication is the best tool we have for 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 anything. As long as we can communicate, uh, we will figure stuff out. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Thanks so much for this conversation. And uh, I will link to all the places where people can uh, can follow you, your website. I'll link to the Oppenheimer video. I think that that's great. Yeah, yeah. and please link to the Freedom Footprint show as well. And go and subscribe to that, people. Uh, yes, do that. Uh, so uh, we'll have a lot of interesting stuff to come there on that channel. Uh, and we're doing a lot of great interviews here in the upcoming months. 
Uh, so yeah, that's my main, what I mainly do these days because I love talking to interesting people. <laughs> Awesome. I'll make sure to uh, to link to that and yeah, everyone subscribe. And so uh, thanks again, Knut, and uh, I hope uh, hope to stay in touch. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, it would be amazing if you could rate, review, and subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. It will help us educate more millennials on the importance of Bitcoin. You can follow and connect with me on Twitter. I'm Bramke. That's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you are or know someone who has an interesting perspective on Bitcoin that's worth sharing, hit me up. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for the next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.